you guys see um, the PowerPoint screen? Yeah, so I'm just, since we're a little bit behind, I do just want to jump right in that we're going to be going over ramen. So this is inelastic scattering. So if you remember last week, we talked about elastic scattering where the wavelength of your incident light and the wavelength of your scattered light are the same. Ramen's different from that. So we're going to be going over that both from the perspective of doing bulk ensemble measurements in a cuvette, but also Raman is frequently used in uh, microscopy as well, which will then like transition to, let's get into some of the details of doing optical microscopy. Um, so like I just mentioned on the previous slide, Raman scattering is an elastic scattering meaning that your incident wavelength that you're shining on your sample does not equal the wavelength that is scattered from your sample. So if you remember from the last lecture, we talked about that scattering is due to oscillations of the electron cloud and um, at the same frequency as your incident light. So in Raman scattering, this differs um, because of vibrations in the mo molecule. So we can draw this similar to like the Jablonski diagram where this is going to be our ground electronic state. We're going to have vibrational energy levels as well, excited vibrational energies. So these are vibrations. And in scattering, you're not going to be reaching an excited electronic state. Instead, you reach a virtual state. So this is what I've drawn in as this dashed line. So in Rayleigh scattering um, that we talked about last time, you have a photon come in and your electron's gonna be excited to this virtual state and then it's gonna return back down to the ground electronic state. So this is Rayleigh and your wavelength incident is equal to your wavelength scattered. In Raman, the vibrational levels come into play. So if we draw the same energy diagram, do you have your electron go up to this virtual state and then when it relaxes back down, it'll relax to an excited vibrational state. So, and if you start in the ground electronic state and relax to an excited vibrational state, this is called Stokes scattering. That's because you're Scattered wavelength is going to be a higher, uh, is going to be larger than your incident. It's going to be a lower energy, and you can see this in the diagram here. Less frequently, you can also have the electron start in an excited vibrational state, be excited into this virtual state, and then relax back down to the ground state. This is also Raman scattering, but it's called anti-Stokes. And this is because um, your wavelength of your scattered light is going to be shorter than your incident. So it's going to be higher energy. This is less, this occurs less frequently than Stokes scattering because the population of electrons that are in an excited vibrational state are less frequent than there's a lower population, smaller number of electrons in an excited vibrational state than the ground vibrational state. So this is rarer. And then finally, we've also talked about IR, which has to do with vibrational levels as well. And when you think of IR absorption, that's, that has no involvement of a virtual state at all. So when we talked about IR, Absorption, that's just we're looking at how many, how much, how many photons are absorbed to put an electron from the ground 
vibrational state to an excited vibrational state. So that's the difference between these. Um, Raman scattering, you can characterize uh, Raman scattering by the Raman shift. And this is typically done in wave numbers. And it's going to be the wave number of your incident light minus the wave number of your scattered light. Um, split units, wave numbers of inverse centimeters. And you can see that commonality with IR spectroscopy because this involves vibrational levels. That's the convention is to use wave numbers here because it involves vibrations. And you can also, the Raman intensity follows an equation that's somewhat similar to when we talked about Beer's law. That the intensity of Raman scattering is going to be equal to the intensity of your incident light, the scat Raman cross section, and I'll define these as we go through, the wave number of the scattered light, your concentration, and your path length. So similar to Beer's Law, we have, some, we have a term for concentration. This is typically reported in this equation as molecules per centimeter squared. This is gonna be your path length. In centimeters, this is going to be your uh, uh, wave number of your scattered light. Do you have that centimeters to the inverse raised to the fourth here? This is different than Beer's law, and then. The sigma term is your Raman cross section. And this is going to be proportional to the Raman scattering probability. And also proportional to the molecular vibrational mode that you're probing. So based on a certain incident wavelength or vibrational mode that you're looking at, how, what is the probability that Raman scattering will occur? And this probability, I forgot to mention that Raman is a very weak effect. That most electrons or most processes are gonna undergo Rayleigh scattering, but Raman only one photon out of like 10 to the 10th photons undergoes Raman scattering. So this is an important thing to remember with Raman scattering. Because it is such a weak effect, there's a lot of considerations in your instrumentation that you have to remove a lot of the Rayleigh scattering to be able to detect the Raman scattering. So you have a very low signal. So the challenges with doing Raman Spectroscopy is how do I get, how do I detect this very low signal over everything else that's taking place? Um, I do want to mention that the, some of the differences between Raman and IR, because we did talk about these and they're, they're both dealing with vibrations. So the classic example of Raman versus IR, they typically show like carbon dioxide shown here that the different vibrations that are taking place, some are Raman active and some are IR active. So if you want to monitor vibrations with IR, you have to be able to see a change in the dipole. So you can see here with, if you can picture how these uh, atoms are moving and how the electron distribution would change here, IR would be observed here, but with this symmetric step stretch, you wouldn't see, because it's symmetric, you wouldn't see a change in the dipole. While Raman active vibrations 
you have to see a change in polarizability. Or an ability to distort electron cloud. So here with all these IR active modes, if you think about the distribution of the electrons, it's going to be the same if you view it in different mirror images. Um, but with this symmetric stretch, you'll, you'll see that electron, the electron distribution spread out. So that's why this mode is Raman active while these aren't. Um, we also want to compare some of what IR is able to do versus what Raman is able to do. Um, some of the benefits of IR spectroscopy over Raman is that it's uh, less expensive. You see IR spectrometers much more frequently than you see Raman. Um, we talked about how there's overtones and overlapping peaks in IR, and this makes it sensitive to small changes. compared to Raman. Um, this also makes the detection limits we talked about in lecture two are better compared to Raman based on those probabilities that I mentioned. Um, and you can compare between instruments more easily. And then finally, quantitative work with IR is slightly better. We talked about in the IR lecture that IR is not the best for quantitative work, but you can push it. Compared to Robin. So those are some of the benefits of IR. Some of Raman has some significant benefits compared to IR for bio, biological samples. Um, and I'd say most significantly is that you can work in water. So you don't have to work with deuterated solvents at all. Um, so this makes bio samples way easier since you don't have to deal with the vibrational peaks from water in Raman. Um, let's see. We just talked about the intensity of the Raman spectra and it does scale with the concentration, that term D. So this does help with uh, some of the quantitative work or you can increase your signal easily by increasing the concentration and that's not true with IR spectroscopy. Um, you can observe the symmetric vibrations. So if you have a molecule that you're interested in and it doesn't have an IR active type of stretch, you can still resolve it in Raman. Um, and you can work here in visible and UV regions of the spectrum. So if you're building an instrument, it's you're using home built instruments, working with visible light is a lot easier than IR light. Um, and also you can have fiber optics and more versatility in the sampling. Uh, compared to IR. Um, if you have fiber optics, you can bring it right up to a sample. You can work with these different wavelength ranges. You can work with solutions, solids, gases more easily than in the infrared. Um, and over here, I just noted some of the history that you'll see C.V. Raman mentioned. That's horrible writing here. You can see it's a, say it's a relatively newer technique, only century old or so compared to uh, Rayleigh scattering methods. Um, so. so getting into the instrumentation with Raman, um, I have two figures here that this is showing in the bottom, this monochromator in a little bit more detail. Um, you can see just like 
when we were talking about dynamic light scattering that you have your sample cell versus your excitation at 90 degrees to reduce, so you're just detecting the scattering light compared to uh, uh, your excitation light here. Uh, for your source, lasers are often used. Um, commonly, argon lasers you'll see um, used with Raman uh, because it has 13 peaks that range from uh, UV 351 nanometers to the IR of 1092 nanometers. Um, and you'll see those used with fiber optics. Uh, lasers, since they're monochromatic, ideally you have a very clear uh, incident wavelength. And if you can tune from the UV to the IR, you can have benefits um, of the intensity that you see. So if you're working in the near UV, you if you remember the um, equation for the intensity of Raman, it scales with the intensity uh, to the fourth, um, the wave number to the fourth, so you'll have a higher intensity, but the drawback is this is more destructive. You work in the visible, if I can spell, if you're working in the visible again, you're in the middle range of you can have higher intensities compared to the IR, but you, the drawback is you have fluorescence uh, that can interfere with your detected signal. Um, visible, of course, has the benefit that you can see it. There's a lot of common equipment for working in the visible. And then finally, the near IR. Um, you can avoid fluorescence and damage, but you're going to have a lower intensity. So basically the inverse of the near UV and the visible. Um, you can see in this diagram that we have a notch filter here that helps reject the Rayleigh scattering. This is really important because of the rarity. Um, for your samples, you can really work with anything, um, gases, water, solids that we discussed. So like, this is not the complicated part of Raman instrumentation. Um, and then, yeah, for getting down to the detector, the monochromator, um, can, they can get pretty complex if you're working for, looking for these rare photons since Raman scattering is, uh, has low probabilities, um, but the key thing is like rejecting Rayleigh, just like with the notch filter as well, you really have to go over kill with that and obtain a spectrum. And then finally, the, your detectors, you can have CCDs, you can have photomultiplier tubes, um, you just need something that has a very low, um, a very high sensitivity. Again, because one photon out of 10 to the 10th photons, that really drives what the instrumentation is for Raman. Um, and to show in some more detail, you can do this, this diagram here is more for like bulk, if you're using a cuvette or some solid surface. Um, but Raman microscopy is becoming increasingly more common. Um, that you can see a schematic here for a commercial Raman setup, where this gives you lots of um, incident wavelength options or wave number options. You can see. We just saw the Thai Sapphire in the Strandy Lab. This diagram has one here where it has that tunability. Um, and with a microscope, this is typically a confocal setup, which we discussed last lecture. So you're looking at a single point 
to fraction limited points, so around 250 nanometers or so, depending on your incident wave number. And you're looking at that single point, and this is, we'll talk about this shortly in the lecture, in this inverted setup, your excitation comes up, you have Raman scattering take place in your sample, and you collect it back down. Um, and then you'll separate it in your monochromator here to be imaged on the CCD, the whole spectrum. Um, over here, I show a specialized monochromator, and this is called a triple spectrograph. And by having three monochromators in a row, you're able to reject most stray light. And Raleigh sc scattering. So over 10 to the 12 photons are rejected. Um, a drawback of so the benefit of this is you have high selectivity. of the wave number that you're interested in. The drawback is you're losing a lot of light. You have low transmission. With all these optics and all these gratings, like five to nine percent, versus if you had a single grating, you would have 30 to 50% or so. So with this type of diagram here, um, getting an idea of what is detected at your CCD detector, I have two examples of um, from the literature, just to give you an idea of like, you get a full spectrum out when you're doing Raman microscopy. It's not just a single color or single bright image. Um, that this paper here from JAX in 2010, this image is a melanoma cell. And you can see that um, they treated it with this peptide that they've abbreviated. This plus means that they added the peptide that might be an example of a peptide that you could use to treat cancer. Um, and the blue is the control, and then they took the difference of the spectra um, in red here. So with these peaks that they're detecting, they're, they're saying that they can tell the secondary structure of the peptide. And this example here, also these spectra show um, how Raman is, commonly used for fingerprinting as well, that you have so many peaks, an example like cell applications that these distinct pe peaks and the difference that will tell you like, is the peptide there or not? Um, they might not be able to assign every single individual peak. Um, and then over here, I have another example where uh, uh, they were looking at a silica bead and they were uh, doping lipids with into that silica bead and showing that uh, they could line the bead with these lipids so they could use it for separation applications. Um, and they could see the change in the Raman spectra based on if this was in a bilayer or disorder and the like. So just showing you that when you perform all this data is from microscopy of like scanning over here and then over this, this area they get the, these signatures out um, in microscopy. So showing you that it's a spectroscopic microscopy. So you get a lot of information out of all these uh, Raman shifts um, in a single location. So it has a lot of data in it. So with all that information on Raman, are there any questions thus far? Now we can shift gears to optical microscopy. We just were talking about Raman microscopy. That's a form of optical microscopy. So I guess I was getting a little ahead of myself. Um, but 
let's get into some of the details of how we characterize Okay, so Andy asked the question, what about Sirs versus Raman? So that's a really good question that you'll see. Let me go back a slide. I can. So Sirs, you might hear that acronym come up. That stands for Surface Enhanced Raman Spectroscopy. So this is a way, I mean, the name of it summarizes it. Surface enhanced means you're performing Raman spectroscopy near a surface. And these are typically, you'll see silver or gold plasmonic particles. And you can have, this is a nice spherical particle of gold, but you'll actually see like spiky shells of gold and they're on the nanoscale, so we can say hundreds of nanometers. And when your light wave comes in, your electric field on these gold nanostructures or silver nanostructures, this, they're around the size of visible wavelengths. So their electron cloud here will oscillate in time with the electric field of the photon that you're sending in. So this will enhance near sharp structures or in gaps between gold nanoparticles that will enhance the electric field in those areas. So if you put a molecule that you're interested in near these enhanced electric fields, if you put a little dye molecule in the gap here, you can increase the number of photons that undergo Raman scattering because the electric field is enhanced there. Um, so this would, I think, scale. This has to do with the incident intensity aspect of the Raman scattering um, that you see. So this is a way to, since Obtaining high enough signal is a challenge in Raman spectroscopy. This is a way to get more Raman photons out. Um, so you'll see lots of nanoscience papers developing new uh, particles to perform surge. You could also do this at metal thin films and the like. Um, there's been a lot of work on the nanoscience side of things, and then they'll demonstrate it with like a fluorescent dye that undergoes lots of Raman scattering. And I'll say that I think there's a lot of papers out there that talk about the nanoscience, but not enough of like, okay, we're actually implementing this and it's a routine application. Um, and I think it's starting to go that way, um, but SIRS is a specialized form of Raman spectroscopy by using these nanomaterials. So that's the long answer to that short summary. And then Kate asked um, that it could do damage to the sample. Can you mitigate this damage or would you just have to avoid Raman altogether if this, that is a concern? So I'd say that Raman can do damage to the sample or any technique if you're working in the UV is when you have damage. Um, and since this is, again, uh, low probability, sometimes you have to crank your excitation up to see things. Um, uh, but if you, have clean samples, if you select your Raman shift very in a informed way, you can avoid that damage. So I would say that Raman is actually more of a non-invasive technique and you'll see Raman spectroscopy be used for like over at the art museum if they're trying to characterize like um, uh, properties of the paint that they're using or trying to date when a piece of artwork is from, Raman's actually used quite frequently because of this fingerprinting aspect and because it's non-destructive um, if you choose things correctly. So that's the answer there, that you can avoid the damage if you're very strategic about how you're using it. I'd say more in the biological samples, if you're trying to look at Raman shifts with UV, 
any biological sample is going to undergo damage if you're working in the ultraviolet uh, region at high intensities. Those are good questions. So let's, let's jump into optical microscopy for the rest of the lecture. Um, when I bring up microscopy or when you hear that term, um, the way I like to summarize microscopy is it just a fancy way, well, especially optical microscopy, a fancy way to control light, to look at things at a small scale. that the most ba basic forms of microscopy or historically the earliest forms of microscopy were just using like water droplets to magnify images. A simple magnifying glass, a single lens is a microscope. And I'm avoiding, we won't be going into all the details of the history of microscopy about talking about like single lens versus compound lenses or getting into the ray optics. If you guys want all the details of that, there's at least two courses in the physics department that will be going over optics. And I'll point you there if you want to get into all those details. Um, what we're going to be talking about for microscopes is going into, again, the components, how they're applied, um, what different types there are. Um, uh, so there's lots of different types of microscopy, optical microscopy. And I'm going to point you guys to chapter three in the Lemke book. And this is actually a problem that's in uh, the problem set of selecting some of these different types of microscopy and going into a little bit of detail about them. Um, but some that you might hear of include bright field, which uses absorption of light. And you have a bright background and a dark sample where your sample will absorb that light. So it's called bright field because the field behind your sample is going to be bright. Um, there's oblique microscopy. And this is when you don't have enough absorption in your sample. So you use uh, to improve your contrast, you bring in light at an angle to help improve your contrast in bright field microscopy. There's dark field, which is using Rayleigh scattering. So again, dark field, your background is dark, your sample is then bright. That's like, it's right in the name. Um, And to increase the chances of Rayleigh scattering, you're using unique excitation geometries where the light's coming in at an angle. Um, there's phase contrast. Microscopy. Um, and when your light is passing through your sample that has a different refractive index, the phase of the light um, changes. And this is what I'm going to be using for refractive index. Um, So the refractive index of something biological is probably somewhere around 1.5 while water is 1.33. So that slight shift in the phase can be detected to detect what's your sample and what's like the solution around it, surrounding it. Um, there's polarized microscopy and this requires that you have a birefringent uh, sample. something that absorbs 
different polarizations of light differently. Um, so this is somewhat specialized. It'll work with liquid crystals. Um, Professor Strandi's group, Professor Rosenblatt's group use polarized microscopy, but it could also be used for biological samples for uh, fibrils that form, and that's like a biological material that is birefringent, and that's where you'll see it come up in um, biophysics. There's photothermal microscopy, and this uses um, the dissipation of heat by your sample to the surroundings, and that causes a change in the refractive index. Um, so what is the change in your refractive index with the temperature of your sample? Um, and just like in phase contrast, light travels differently through these different refractive indi indices. Um, and this is somewhat specialized as well. You have to have a sample that dissipates heat. enough uh, to have a refractive index change. So you also use like specialized solvents. There is DIC microscopy. This is differential interference contrast. And this is, again, using parallel and perpendicular um, polarizations of light and looking at their interference. Um, so you'll take images with both polarizations and detect them and look at that difference between them. Um, and then we're going to go into more detail next week on different forms of fluorescence microscopy. Um, where the optical sectioning defines the type. So we talked about confocal. I'll go into a little more detail about that next week. We'll talk about total internal reflection fluorescence. And then also near field methods. So yeah, we could have, clearly, we could have a whole class just devoted to microscopy with all these different techniques. Um, that's why in the problem set, take some time to read about a couple of them and get some more uh, background of uh, the details of how they work. Um, but you can see that there's absorption, there's scattering, there's fluorescence, there's all these different ways that uh, light interacts with your sample that are taken advantage of in these microscopes. Um, just like in the same way with spectroscopy, you're looking at these different types of interactions. Um, but here, the important thing with microscope versus spectroscopy is you're looking at spatial information. That's the difference between, I would say, a spectroscopic technique versus microscopic technique. And if you're looking at both, um, I guess, wavelengths and location, that's a spectroscopic microscopic job. But that's getting more specialized. Um, when you guys were discussing the different equipment in BioVox, I think you guys started to get out the different ways that microscopes are categorized. Um, that, I guess the first one, if we're looking at this first row here, is where is the detected light coming from? versus where the sample is. If you're looking at it above the sample, that's what you call an upright microscope. If you're looking at it below, that's what you're calling an inverted microscope. You can also characterize light microscopes based on where is the, um, where is the light coming from? Yes. versus the sample and detector. So here for an inverted microscope or an upright microscope, if your light is passing through your sample and your detector 
and your excitation light and your detected light are on separate sides of the sample. That's what you call a trans, um, um, transmitted, a transmission microscope. So this works with transparent samples. If you have your illumination and detection on the same side, and shown here for an upright and an inverted microscope, um, that will be called a uh, reflection microscope. Um, so this is used for fluorescent samples. Um, and also opaque samples. Where if your sample is opaque, your light wouldn't be able to pass through there. So upright versus inverted, transmission versus reflection microscope. Those are the terms that are going to come before the name of the microscope so you understand what, can do, what type of samples that you can use, where your detector is going to be. Um, and going into some of the details of the parts of the microscope, I wasn't going to bring up like the high school diagram of like coarse focus, fine focus, the arms and stuff like that. Um, that's more for like a bench top inspection microscope. Um, but some of the components that you'll see for light sources, these can vary greatly um, depending on your micro microscopy, all those different types. Um, you can see lasers and LEDs if you're using a single wavelength of light that you're interested in um, and high intensity. Uh, but for things like bright field and dark field where you're looking at absorption or scattering, that's where you'll see lamps used. Um, very similar to ones we've discussed before like mercury, xenon, um, tungsten lamps that work in those different regions of the spectrum and have different intensities. So uh, depending on your application, go back to that table from uh, the Scoob at Holler Crouch book um, can tell you those regions there. Um, an important form of excitation is when you're using lamps are condensers. Um, this is very important and can help define like how well your focus is. So you can see here are some example white light condensers where you have your light on the top this light will then be condensed through the condenser and focused at your sample plane here. And if you have a nice condenser, you'll have Kohler illumination. And this is a way that your, um, your light and objective are at the same focal point. I'd say these are pretty routine on all microscopes with condensers now. So it means that like you're in focus with that site. You're using your lamp to the highest intensity. It's focused at the same plane that you're collecting your light through your objective, which we'll talk about on the next slide. Other important aspects of microscopes um, are the filters and the mirrors that are within the microscope that are controlling the direction of the light and what light passes through. Um, So different terminology for these filters, if you're working with physicists, you'll use terms that are similar to names that you've heard in electronics. So band pass will let a narrow band through. You'll see long pass. And these are all terms that are used based on uh, wavelength um, instead of frequency. So long pass filter means like, Red wavelengths pass, bluer wavelengths are rejected. There's short pass filters, 
where your bluer wavelengths pass. Um, there's notch filters. I can't spell. And these are just specialized bandpass filters that only let reject um, a single wavelength or close to a single wavelength. So notch filters are used if you're using a laser and you want to remove that laser excitation. Um, in terms of mirrors, you'll hear about dichroic mirrors. And they reflect some wavelengths and allow other wavelengths to pass. Um, a beam splitter is something that will let like 50% light through and 50% uh, reflected. So dichroic is a beam splitter that is based on wavelength. Um, and then you'll also hear about neutral density filters And these just remove a certain percentage of light is absorbed to control the power. So those are the different terms you might hear up here come up with different filters and, and mirrors. And like I mentioned, this is like terminology that physicists use. If you're working with biologists, they're going to talk about filters like a FITSI filter set or a rhodamine filter set or a GFP filter set. And that's a combination of filters that are inside the microscope and they say, oh, I'm, I have green fluorescent protein in my sample, so I'm gonna use the green fluorescent protein set. And it's a combination of all of these filters and that's where some of the more black box approach comes to it. They're like, I know this works for these dyes, so I'm okay. But they might not, if they haven't looked into the details, um, they might not know what combination they are. So this is an example shown here of different types of filters where this is a bandpass filter. Um, the black is your dichroic where you can see all of the wavelengths shorter than 650 are reflected and anything longer than 650 is transmitted through. So this is designed, and then there's a long pass filter in red. Um, so this is a filter set that's designed to work with a 633 nanometer laser for like signing five dyes. And that's what's sold as a set where if you go to the microscopy core, they'll say like, oh, we have the filter set for sci five. If you go to a home-built microscope, people will say like, oh, and here we have this dichroic, we have this long pass, or a bad pass elsewhere. The most important component of your microscope that defines a lot of its capability is going to be your objective. And an objective really is a fancy collection of lenses. Where you can see here for different lenses, for different types of objectives, You'll have different combinations of lens groups. They have a lot of control, and that's why you purchase an objective, because trying to build one of these yourself is pretty much impossible. Um, we're going to skip over some of the ray optics information um, uh, with how objectives focus light, but some of the important parameters with objectives is the magnification. How much is it expanding your image? Um, the immersion medium. So at the interface between your, this is your objective and your sample, what's in between here? And you can have air, you can have water, you can have oil. And again, this has to do with the refractive indices of those. So this immersion medium also relates to the numerical aperture. of your objective or the NA. And this defines the ability to gather light. And also your resolution of your objective. So your numerical aperture 
is defined as your refractive index times sine with that um, angle that you can collect your light at. I thought, okay, in the notes that you guys can get online, I have um, a diagram for the numerical aperture. So if you have your sample, And if your sample is down here, and this is where you're collecting the light from, alpha is going to be this angle here. If your working distance is closer to your objective, that angle is going to be greater. Uh, and your numerical aperture is then greater uh, if you can collect from a larger angle. Um, and this is also related to the working distance of how far is your objective from your sample. When it's in focus. And we'll go over numerical aperture in a little bit more detail. Um, so these are, there's a lot of parameters with objectives that we could uh, talk about in more detail. In the problem set, there's a question that relates to different terminology with objectives. You can see that this is an example from Zeiss, looking at the uh, magnification here, um, the numerical aperture, this is 1.3, it's telling you that it's used for differential interference contrast microscopy. Um, and there's these different types of terms for objectives that you'll see thrown around. And this has to do with how they correct for different uh, aberrations. So aberrations are defects that are in, inherent in optics. So you can have chromatic and this is that lenses don't focus, a single simple lens won't focus all wavelengths of light the same way. Um, there's also spherical aberrations that have to do with if you have a single lens, again, and you have light passing through. If you pass something through at the edge, you're bending that light much more than if something's passing through the center. So you can have aberrations based on that bending of that light. Um, and then there's curvature uh, aberrations as well that as your lens gets, if you're working with a smaller lens or a larger lens, it's more curved at the edges. Being able to make a lens that's perfect um, is challenging and you're going to have more errors for at the edges versus near the center of your lens here. So you can see that they can correct for these different aberrations, and that's where some of this terminology comes from and different wavelengths that it works for. Um, okay. After the objective, we've talked about excitation light, getting that light to the sam up to the objective, and the objective is the goal is to focus it on. The sample. And I'm missing. Also missing a slide. So let me go back over here to numerical aperture and also take a look at the notes that this also defines your resolution of your microscope. Where your resolution is your ability to, if you have two objects you're trying to resolve or you're trying to image, do they overlap? Are they well separated? How can you tell them apart? Um, and this is also related to the numerical aperture and your resolution is going to be 0 0.61 times your wavelength over the numerical aperture. So the higher, and this is going to be in units of typically nanometers or distance. So the higher your numerical aperture, the smaller this value gets, the better you can resolve uh, things. You can also, so you can control the resolution of your measurement based on your wavelengths, shorter wavelengths, smaller resolution, or higher, you want this to be high and you want your wavelength to be low. And we'll talk about this 
next Tuesday when we're talking about super resolution microscopy. So I'll go over that again then. Sorry about that, I'm jumping around. So getting back to samples, um, when you're working with objectives, um, the thickness of the glass or your cover slip is well defined. Objectives are designed to work with number 1.5 glass, 0.16 to 0.19 millimeters. So you can see they come in a bunch of different shapes here. But if you're trying to do imaging through a thick cover slip, or if you go to the storeroom, they sell number one glass, and that's wrong and won't work with microscopy. Uh, your objective isn't going to be working the way it's designed to. So make sure that you're working with number 1.5 glass because it's designed, that working distance of your objective is designed for a specific thickness of the glass. They also, you can see here, they sell like specialized dishes where the center here is that, again, that number 1.5 glass. And you can have media on top. So if you're trying to image cells, you can still have the media there, or the solution there, so your cells are happy. It doesn't have to be an error sample because also can get a lot more complicated if you're working with like microfluidics and the like. Okay. To make sure that we get through everything. Um, yeah, with that. Okay, I'm really sorry. Go to the notes where all the slides are there. Before we're getting into, these are 2D detectors. That we've discussed a little bit. 1D detectors are also used in microscopy. So these would be like the photomultiplier tube or an avalanche photodiode. And if you're working with 1D detectors, these are typically used with a confocal setup where you're measuring one point on your sample and you have to scan your image. So as you're scanning at your sample, your 1D detector, you're collecting photons there, and um, you have these synchronized in a way that you know at this time point, I'm at this location. So that's how 1D detectors work, and the scanning will take more time to produce an image. Compared to if you're working with 2D detectors, the most common ones in microscopy are going to be your charge coupled device or your complementary metal oxide semiconductor. Um, and both of these are a way to convert photons to an electron with all the spectroscopic detectors that we're, uh, we've been discussing. But the way they differ is in how they, how they move those electrons um, and where they convert them. So with the CCD, you have, these are going to be your pixels and you collect at each pixel, you have electrons and then you're going to collect all of those at the end of the row of the pixels and all the columns. And then you convert that um, to your electrical signal. In CMOS, this is going to be in parallel. So each chip, each pixel here, you'll convert from photons to an electrons and then your electrons then you do your analog to digital converter, and then you read those signals out with the CMOS detector. In the interest of time, we're not gonna be able to go into details with these guys. Um, but I do wanna talk about, since this shows up in your uh, problem set, that if you're characterizing your detector, if it's a CCD or CMOS, or it's a 1D detector, these are some of the values that you need to know. You need to know the quantum efficiency, where this is how efficient, it's in the name, you go from a photon to an electron at a specific wavelength. So these are typically plotted, again, I'm missing information, I don't know why as the quantum efficiency versus wavelength, where you might have a detector that'll look like this versus let's say 
if you're interested further in the IR, you'd pick this detector over something if you're looking at not UV. Um, or so. With 2D detectors, your pixel size is important. Where you have your physical size, so that's how big it is on the chip. And the larger your pixel size is, the more, the more photons it can capture versus your image size. So the greater it is, more photons um, is a benefit, but then also uh, you might have less pixels on your chip. The image size is after all the optics. How big is a pixel in your images versus a sample? And there's like an Air Force, I think it's Air Force 1951. It's like this little ch glass slide that has bars on it. And you can measure the distance and the size of those bars to characterize what your pixel size is for the image. Um, the pixel size for your image size, I mean the pixel image size, is important with the Nyquist sampling theorem that you want to be able, let's say you have a row of pixels here. If you have two emitters and they're in the same pixel, you're not going to be able to resolve those. You're just going to see a high signal versus Let's say you have a smaller image pixel size. We doubled it here. You still wouldn't be able to see this. I mean, it would be over two pixels. But let's say you quadruple it or so with your pixels. If they're in two separate pixels, you would then see the difference here. Where your Nyquist sampling theorem means that you have to have um, your sampling interval rate twice the highest, two times your sampling must be two times the highest frequency you want to resolve. Where in imaging, your sampling frequency has to be the spatial distance between what you want to resolve. Um, okay, I know we're running out of time. We'll talk about noise next week, the readout rate, gain is if you're multiplying your electron signal, and your dynamic range and things we talked about in lecture two. So I'll go over these. I know we ran out of time. I'll go over these um, at the start of next lecture. And I want to point out, yeah, I'm missing slides. I'm really sorry about that. That chapter three of Lumpke, and then also on the notes that are on Canvas, there's links to Zeiss, Nikon, Olympus, and uh, instrument manufacturers. And they have really nice microscopy view websites that can give you a lot of information and background about the microscopy. I would say it's better than most textbooks that I've seen on that. Um, so yeah, sorry for running over a little bit. So let's see. Okay, so Andy sent a nice link to the Air Force uh, target. And I'm sorry my slides were like messed up on this. Um, but are there any questions right now? Cool, so I'll see you guys next Tuesday and I'll plan it so we'll be ca caught up by then. And I'm sorry that today was a little bit more of a rush. So see you guys then.